Hey guys, it's me, Mrs. Maine, your friendly neighborhood challenge teacher, coming to you today from my messy home office uh, to talk to you about Act One of the play Henry V, Henry V. Um, we've done tragedies before, we've done comedies before, but we haven't done a Shakespearean history before. And one thing you'll notice about these sh this Shakespearean history, and kind of all of them, is that they have elements of the tragedies and they have elements of the comedies all mixed together. So you'll see like an epic speech like you saw in Julius Caesar. There's one of those in this play. Um, but they're also like wacky misunderstandings and people in disguise. So it's a real mixed bag and it's really hard to describe. So we're just gonna go ahead and dive right into it. So first things first, hopefully um, you read my cartoon <laughs> version of the first two plays in this series, Henry IV Part One, Henry IV Part Two. This is the final play in that particular trilogy. It's all about Prince Hal, whose father has died. Now he's king of England and he's gonna go, <laughs> he's gonna go on this epic battle and things are going to be super, super momentous. So, uh, one other thing that we haven't seen before in any of the plays we've studied is the very first thing that happens in this play is that a character called the chorus comes on stage all by himself and he stands up there and he's like audience imagine this is not just a plain wooden stage imagine uh you're in a castle the <laughs> we're going to talk more about the chorus later because i super love it and we haven't seen this before um but the object of the chorus is like to remind the audiences to use their imaginations and to sort of set the scene because we're going to be switching scenes a lot in this play um, and it just helps if the audience can imagine what's happening. Shakespeare's plays were performed on a round stage in his theater, The Globe, and they had costumes but they didn't have any scenery. They didn't have any backstage anything. So the audiences had to use their imagination and um, I don't know, it's just different and new, and the chorus comes on before every act. So, so keep an eye out for that, because it's kind of cool. So after the chorus comes out and says, use your imagination, sometimes this will be a field of battle, and sometimes this will be a castle, and sometimes we'll be in France, uh, then two bishops come on. Well, there's the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I think it's the Bishop of Eli. These are powerful um, clergymen, members of the church, in England at the time, there was only one religion you were allowed to be, and that was Catholic. Only, <laughs> there wasn't any other kind of Christian yet. If you were Christian, you were Catholic, because Martin Luther hadn't done his thing yet. So whenever they say the church, what they mean is the Catholic church. So um, they are these two churchmen, and they're really rich, and they're really wealthy, and they're really concerned, because Henry V has proposed a bill uh, that would take some of the money away from them, from the the church, but specifically from them, and use it for other things. He wants uh, to use some of the money for the army, and he wants to give some of the money to poor people, and he wants some of it to go to the royal treasury. And so this would be good for England, but that would be super bad for them, because then they would have less money. So they're like, hmm... How do we distract a teenage boy? What do teenage boys like? Oh, I know, they like war and they like killing things. Let's see if we can't like plot to make Henry declare war on France and then he'll go off to France and have his little war and we can keep our money and keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> anyway, so then they talk a little bit about King Henry and his background basically they give his origin story, which is really nice, uh, in case you've missed the first two plays. And they say, wait for it, the courses of his youth promised it not, the breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness, mortified in him, seemed to die too. So they're giving his origin story, his background, they're saying he, um, when he was a prince, he partied a lot and he didn't care about anything. The courses of his youth promised it not. He when he was young, he didn't look like he was going to be a good king. He looked like he'd be a really super sucky king. But then his dad died, and as soon as the last breath left his father's body, the wildness mortified in him. That means, like, uh, Prince Hal, his dad died, and then he was, like, instantly, the moment his dad died, all of that, like, party boy, wildness, slacker kid just, like, died. Mortified means, like, drop dead. Like, he killed that part of himself and instantly became, like, a super serious 
noble, responsible king. And that's great. That's great for England. Uh, and then they're uh, members of the church. So they make a simile, which is, I'm sure you guys have heard of similes at this point, but you use the word like or as to uh, describe something. They use a biblical simile because, you know, um, that's kind of their whole life. They've dedicated their life to the church. So they talk a little bit about the story of Adam and Eve. Let me read you the next part. Uh, yea, at that very moment, consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him, leaving his body as a paradise. So first they said, uh, he was a really wild kid. We didn't expect much from him, but as soon as his dad died, he got super serious. Uh, then they make this adorable simile where they're like, he drove the wildness out of him the way God drove Adam out of the Garden of Eden. I don't know if you know the story, but Adam and Eve lived in paradise, and uh, then they got kicked out. There's an apple involved. Don't worry too much about it. But uh, then King Henry comes in. So the scene is set, right? He's got his advisors. He's got royal people all around him because King Henry never goes anywhere alone. And uh, they sit down and they talk to Henry quite a lot, quite a lot about how come, even though he's king of England, really he deserves to be king of France as well. It's really complicated. It has to do with something called the Salic Law, which you do not need to know about or care about. But basically, the current king of France, Charles, he was descended from a daughter of a king. And Henry is related to the son of a king of France, but much, much more distantly related. His like great, 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 great granddad was king of France or something. So they're saying, because France has this law that you're really not supposed to inherit the throne if you get it through a daughter rather than a son, um, you, even though you're way farther removed, have a greater claim on the <laughs> a greater claim on the throne of France. Whew. And Henry was like, yeah, that's cool, but I don't know if I want to go to war quite yet. Like, people would die and it would cost a lot of money. And so his advisors are like, you know what, Henry, just think on it some, would you? And then in come the French ambassadors. Now, um, Henry has literally just become king of England and it's customary to send gifts. So all the kings and queens from all the other lands, from Spain and Denmark and wherever else, they send gifts. And it's kind of like a sorry your dad died, but happy your king gift. I don't know what would be appropriate, but they send nice things, mechanical birds, and um, I, I, I genuinely don't know what you would get a king, but they send nice gifts. So the ambassadors of France come in with a gift for King Henry, and he opens it up, and it's tennis balls. Now, I don't know what you buy uh, for a king, but tennis balls is not it. <laughs> this is um, this is a serious diss. The prince, the crown prince of France, the Dauphin, which means dolphin, it's, it's French. The Dauphin, the crown prince, um, sends Henry tennis balls to remind him that um, he likes to play games and he's basically just a child. This makes him very mad. And he's like, you know what? It's war, France. And that's the end of act one.